Chapter Eleven of the Chimney Corner by Harriet Beecher Stowe. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by William Jones, Benita Springs, Florida. Chapter Eleven, The Cathedral. I'm going to build a cathedral one of these days said i to my wife as i sat looking at the slant line of light made by the afternoon sun on our picture of the cathedral of milan that picture is one of the most poetic things you have among your house ornaments said rudolph its original is the world's chief beauty a tribute to religion such as art never gave before and never can again as much before the pantheon as the alps with their virgin snows and glittering pinnacles are above all temples made with hands say what you will those middle ages that you call dark had a glory of faith that never will be seen in our days of cotton mills and manchester prints where will you marshal such an army of saints as stands in yonder white marble forest visibly transfigured and glorified in that celestial italian air saint chip belonged to the medieval church their heroism of religion has died with it that's just like one of your assertions rudolph said i you might as well say that nature has never made any flowers since linnaeus shut up his herbarium we have no statues and pictures of modern saints but saints themselves, thank God, have never been wanting, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be. But what about your cathedral? said my wife. Oh, yes, my cathedral, yes. When my stocks in cloudland rise, I'll build a cathedral larger than Milan's, and the men, but more particularly the women thereon, shall be those who have done even more then st paul tells of in the saints of old who subdued kingdoms wrought righteousness quenched the violence of fire escaped the edge of the sword out of weakness were made strong waxed valiant in fight turned to fight the enemies of the aliens i am not now thinking of florence nightingale nor of the host of women who have been walking worthily in her footsteps but of nameless saints of more retired and private state domestic saints who have tended children not their own through whooping cough and measles and borne the unruly whims of fretful invalids stocking darning shirt-making saints saints who wore no visible garment of haircloth bound themselves with no belts of spikes and nails yet in their inmost souls were marked and seared with the red cross of lifelong self-sacrifice saints for whom the mystical terms self-annihilation and self-crucifixion had a real intangible meaning all the stronger because their daily death was marked by no outward sign no mystical rites consecrated them no organ music burst forth in solemn rapture to welcome them no habit of their order proclaimed to themselves and to the world that they were the elect of christ the brides of another life but small eating cares daily prosaic duties the petty friction of all the littleness and all the inglorious annoyances of every day were as dust that hid the beauty and grandeur of their calling even from themselves they walked unknown even to their households unknown even to their own souls but when the lord comes to build his new jerusalem we shall find many a white stone with a new name thereon and the record of deeds and words which only he that seeth in secret knows many a humble soul will be amazed to find that the seed it sowed in such weakness in the dust of daily life has blossomed into immortal flowers under the eye of the lord when i build my cathedral that woman i said pointing to a small painting by the fire shall be among the first of my saints 
you see her there in an everyday dress cap with a mortal thread lace border and with a very ordinary worked collar fastened by a visible and terrestrial breast pin there is no nimbus around her head no sign of the cross upon her breast her hands are clasped on no crucifix or rosary her clear keen hazel eye looks as if it could sparkle with mirthfulness as in fact it could there are in it both the subtile flash of wit and the subdued light of humour and though the whole face smiles it has yet a certain decisive firmness that speaks the soul immutable in good that woman shall be the first saint in my cathedral and her name shall be recorded as saint esther what makes saintliness in my view as distinguished from ordinary goodness is a certain quality of magnanimity and greatness of soul that brings life within the circle of the heroic to be really great in little things to be truly noble and heroic in the insipid details of everyday life is a virtue so rare as to be worthy of canonization and this virtue was hers new england puritanism must be credited with the making of many such women severe it was her discipline and harsh as it seems now her rule we have yet to see whether women will be born of modern systems of tolerance and indulgence equal to those grand ones of the olden times whose places now know them no more the inconceivable austerity and solemnity with which puritanism invested this mortal life the awful grandeur of the themes which it made household words the sublimity of the issues which it hung upon the commonest acts of our earthly existence created characters of more than roman strength and greatness and the good men and women of puritan training excelled the saints of the middle ages as a soul fully developed intellectually educated to closest thought and exercised in reasoning is superior to a soul great merely through impulse and sentiment Quote, my earliest recollections of aunt esther for so our saint was known were of a bright-faced cheerful witty quick-moving little middle-aged person who came into our house like a good fairy whenever there was a call of sickness or trouble if an accident happened in the great roistering family of eight or ten children and when was not something happening to some of us and we were shut up in a sick room then duly as daylight came the quick step and cheerful face of aunt esther not solemn and lugubrious like so many sick-room nurses but with a never-failing flow of wit and story that could beguile even the most doleful into laughing at their own afflictions i remember how a fit of the quinsy most tedious of all sicknesses to an active child was gilded and glorified into quite a fate by my having aunt esther all to myself for two whole days with nothing to do but amuse me she charmed me into smiling at the very pangs which had made me weep before and of which she described in her own experiences in a manner to make me think that after all the quinsy was something with an amusing side to it her knowledge of all sorts of medicines gargles and alleviatives her perfect familiarity with every canon and law of good nursing and tending was something that could only have come from long experience in those good old new england days when there were no nurses recognized as a class in the land but when watching and the care of the sick were among those offices of christian life which the families of a neighborhood reciprocally rendered each other even from early youth she had obeyed a special vocation as a sister of charity in many a sick room and with the usual keen intelligence of new england had widened her powers of doing good by the reading of medical and physiological works her legend of nursing in those days of long typhus fever and other formidable and protracted forms of disease 
were to our ears quite wonderful, as we regarded her as a sort of patron saint of the sick room. She seemed always so cheerful, so bright, and so devoted, that it never occurred to us youngsters to doubt that she enjoyed, above all things, being with us, waiting on us all day, watching over us by night, telling us stories, and answering in her own lively and always amusing and instructive way that incessant fire of questions with which a child persecutes a grown person. Sometimes, as a reward of goodness, we were allowed to visit her in her own room, a neat little parlor in the neighborhood whose windows looked down a hillside on one hand under the boughs of an apple orchard where daisies and clover and bobolinks always abounded in the summer time and on the other faced the street with a green yard flanked by one or two shady elms between them and the street no nun's cell was ever neater no bee's cell ever more compactly and carefully arranged and to us familiar with the confusion of a great family of little ones there was something always inviting about its stillness its perfect order and the air of thoughtful repose that breathed over it she lived there in perfect independence doing as it was her delight to do every office of life for herself she was her own cook her own parlor and chambermaid her own laundress and very faultless the cooking washing ironing and care of the premises were a slice of aunt esther's gingerbread one of aunt esther's cookies had we all believed certain magical properties such as belonged to no other mortal mixture even a handful of walnuts that were brought from the depths of her mysterious closet had virtues in our eyes such as no other walnuts could approach the little shelf of books that hung suspended by cords against her wall was sacred in our regard the volumes were like no other books and we supposed that she derived from them those stores of knowledge on all subjects which she unconsciously dispensed among us for she was always telling us something of metals or minerals or gems or plants or animals which awakened our curiosity stimulated our inquiries and above all led us to wonder where she had learned it all even the slight restrictions which her neat habits imposed on our breezy and turbulent natures seemed all quite graceful and becoming it was right in our eyes to cleanse our shoes on a scraper and mat with extra diligence and then to place a couple of chips under the heels of our boots when we essayed to dry our feet at her spotless hearth we marveled to see our own faces reflected in a thousand smiles and winks from her bright brass andirons such andirons we thought were seen on earth in no other place and a pair of radiant brass candlesticks that illustrated the mantelpiece were viewed with no less respect aunt esther's cat was a model for all cats so sleek so intelligent so decorous and well trained always occupying exactly her own cushion by the fire and never transgressing in one iota the properties belonging to a cat of good breeding she shared our affections with her mistress and we were allowed as a great favor and privilege now and then to hold the favorite on our knees and stroke her satin coat to a smoother gloss but it was not for cats alone that she had attractions she was in sympathy and fellowship with everything that moved and lived knew every bird and beast with a friendly acquaintanceship the squirrels that inhabited the trees in the front yard were won in time by her blandishments to come and perch on her window-sills and thence by trains of nuts adroitly laid they disport themselves on the shining cherry tea table that stood between the windows and we youngsters used to sit entranced with a delight as they gambled and waved their furry tails in frolicsome security eating rations of gingerbread and bits of seed cake with as good a relish as any child amongst us the habits the rights the wrongs the wants and the sufferings of the animal creation 
formed the subject of many an interesting conversation with her and we boys with the natural male instinct of hunting trapping and pursuing were often made to pause in our career remembering her pleas for the dumb things which could not speak for themselves her little hermitage was the favorite resort of numerous friends many of the young girls who attended the village academy made her acquaintance and nothing delighted her more than that they should come there and read to her the books they were studying when her superior and wide information enabled her to light up and explain much that was not clear to the immature students in her shady retirement too she was a sort of ageria to certain men of genius who came to read to her their writings to consult her in their arguments and to discuss with her the literature and politics of the day through all of which her mind moved with an equal step yet with a sprightliness and vivacity peculiarly feminine her memory was remarkably retentive not only of the contents of books but of all that great outlaying fund of anecdote and story which the quaint and earnest new england life always supplied there were pictures of peculiar characters legends of true events stranger than romance all stored in the cabinets of her mind and these came from her lips with the greater force because the precision of her memory enabled her to authenticate them with name date and circumstances of vivid reality and from that shadowy line of incidents which marks the twilight boundary between the spiritual world and the present life she drew legends of peculiar clearness but invested with the mysterious charm which always dwells in that uncertain region and the shrewd flash of her eye and the keen bright smile with which she answered the wondering question what do you suppose it was or what would it have been showed how evenly rationalism in her mind kept pace with romance the retired room in which she thus read studied thought and surveyed from afar the whole world of science and literature and in which she received friends and entertained children was perhaps the dearest and freshest spot to her in the world there came a time however when the neat little independent establishment was given up and she went to associate herself with two of her nieces in keeping house for a boarding school of young girls here her lively manners and her gracious interest in the young made her a universal favorite though the cares she assumed broke in upon these habits of solitude and study which formed her delight from the day that she surrendered this independency of hers she had never for more than a score of years a home of her own but filled the trying position of an accessory in the home of others leaving the boarding school she became the helper of an invalid wife and mother in the early nursing and rearing of a family of young children an office which leaves no privacy and no leisure her bed was always shared with some little one her territories were exposed to the constant inroads of little pattering feet and all the various sicknesses and ailments of delicate childhood made absorbing drafts on her time after a while she left new england with the brother to whose family she devoted herself the failing health of the wife and mother left more and more the charge of all things in her hands servants were poor and all the appliances of living had the rawness and inconvenience which in those days attended western life it became her fate to supply all other people's defects and deficiencies wherever a hand failed there must her hand be whenever a foot faltered she must step into the ranks she was the one who thought for and cared for and toiled for all yet made never a claim that any one should care for her 
it was not till late in my life that i became acquainted with the deep interior sacrifice the constant self-abnegation which all her life involved she was born with a strong vehement impulsive nature a nature both proud and sensitive a nature whose tastes were passions whose likings and whose aversions were of the most intense and positive character devoted as she always seemed to the mere practical and material she had naturally a deep romance and enthusiasm of temperament which exceeded all that can be written in novels it was chiefly owing to this that a home and a central affection of her own were never hers in her early days of attractiveness none who would have sought her could meet the high requirements of her ideality she never saw her hero and so never married family cares the tending of young children she often confessed were peculiarly irksome to her she had the head of a student a passionate love for the world of books a protestant convent where she might devote herself without interruption to study was her ideal of happiness she had too the keenest appreciation of poetry of music of painting and of natural scenery her enjoyment in any of these things was intensely vivid whenever by chance a stray sunbeam of the kind darted across the dusty path of her life yet in all these her life was a constant repression the eagerness with which she would listen to any account from those more fortunate ones who had known these things showed how ardent a passion was constantly held in check a short time before her death talking with a friend who had visited switzerland she said with great feeling all my life my desire to visit the beautiful places of this earth has been so intense that i cannot but hope that after my death i shall be permitted to go and look at them the completeness of her self-discipline may be gathered from the fact that no child could ever be brought to believe she had not a natural fondness for children or that she found the care of them burdensome it was easy to see that she had naturally all those particular habits those minute pertinacities and respects to her daily movements and the arrangement of all her belongings which would make the meddling intrusive demands of infancy and childhood particularly hard for her to meet yet never was there a pair of toddling feet that did not make free with aunt esther's room never a curly head that did not look up in confiding assurance of a welcome smile to her bright eyes the inconsiderate and never-ceasing requirements of children and invalids never drew from her other than a cheerful response and to my mind there is more saintship in this than in the private wearing of any number of hair-cloth shirts or belts lined with spikes in a large family of careless noisy children there will be constant losing of thimbles and needles and scissors but aunt esther was always ready without reproach to help the careless and the luckless her things so well kept and so treasured she was willing to lend with many a caution and injunction it is true but also with a relish of right good will and to do us justice we generally felt the sacredness of the trust and were more careful of her things than of our own if a shade of sewing silk were wanting or a choice button or a bit of braid or tape aunt esther cheerfully volunteered something from her well-kept stores not regarding the trouble she made herself in seeking the key unlocking the drawer and searching out in bag or parcel just the treasure demanded never was more perfect precision or more perfect readiness to accommodate others her little income scarcely reaching a hundred dollars yearly was disposed of with a generosity worthy of a fortune one-tenth was sacredly devoted to charity and a still further sum 
laid by every year for presents to friends. No Christmas or New Year ever came round that Aunt Esther, out of this very tiny fund, did not find something for children and servants. Her gifts were trifling in value, but well-timed, a ball of thread wax, a paper of pens, a pincushion, something generally so well chosen as to show that she had been running over our needs and noting what to give. She was no less gracious as receiver than as giver. The little articles that we made for her, or the small presents that we could buy out of our childish resources, she always declared were exactly what she needed and she delighted us by the care she took of them and the value she set upon them her income was a source of the greatest pleasure to her as maintaining an independence without which she could not have been happy though she constantly gave to every family in which she lived services which no money could repay it would have been the greatest trial to her not to be able to provide for herself her dress always that of a true gentlewoman refined quiet and neat was bought from this restricted sum and her small travelling expenses were paid out of it she abhorred anything false or flashy her caps were trimmed with real thread lace and her silk dresses were of the best quality perfectly well made and kept and after all a little sum always remained over in her hands for unforeseen exigencies this love of independence was one of the strongest features of her life and we often playfully told her that her only form of selfishness was the monopoly of saintship that she who gave so much was not willing to allow others to give to her that she who made herself servant to all was not willing to allow others to serve her among the trials of her life must be reckoned much ill health born however with such heroic patience that it was not easy to say when the hand of pain was laid upon her she inherited too a tendency of depression of spirits which at times increased to a morbid and distressing gloom few knew or suspected these sufferings so completely had she learned to suppress every outward manifestation that might interfere with the happiness of others in her hours of depression she resolutely forbore to sadden the lives of those around her with her own melancholy and often her darkest moods were so lighted up and adorned with an outside show of wit and humour that those who had known her intimately were astonished to hear that she had ever been subject to depression her truthfulness of nature amounted almost to superstition from her promise once given that she felt no change of purpose could absolve her and therefore rarely would she give it absolutely for she could not alter the thing that had gone forth from her lips our belief in the certainty of her fulfilling her word was like our belief in the immutability of the laws of nature whoever asked her got of her the absolute truth on every subject and when she had no good thing to say her silence was often truly awful when anything mean or ungenerous was brought to her knowledge she would close her lips resolutely but the flash in her eyes showed what she would speak were speech permitted in her last days she spoke to a friend of what she had suffered from the strength of her personal antipathies i thank god she said that i believe at last i have overcome all that too and that there has not been for some years any human being toward whom i have felt a movement of dislike the last year of her life was a constant discipline of unceasing pain born with that fortitude which could make her an entertaining and interesting companion even while the sweat of mortal agony was starting from her brow her own room she kept as a last asylum to which she would silently retreat when the torture became too intense 
for the repression of society. And there alone, with closed doors, she wrestled with her agony. The stubborn independence of her nature took refuge in this final fastness, and she prayed only that she might go down to death with the full ability to steady herself all the way, needing the help of no other hand. The ultimate struggle of earthly feeling came when this proud self-reliance was forced to give way, and she was obliged to leave herself helpless in the hands of others. "'God requires that I should give up my last form of self-will,' she said. "'Now I have resigned this. Perhaps he will let me go home.' In a good old age, death the friend came and opened the door of this mortal state, and a great soul, that had served a long apprenticeship to little things, went forth into the joy of its Lord, a life of self-sacrifice and self-abnegation passed into a life of endless rest. Oh, but, said Rudolph, I rebel at this life of self-abnegation and self-sacrifice. I do not think it the duty of noble women who have beautiful natures and enlarged and cultivated tastes to make themselves the slaves of the sick-room and nursery. Such was not the teaching of our New England faith, said I absolute unselfishness the death of self such were its teachings and such as esther's the characters it made do the duty nearest thee was the only message it gave to women with a mission from duty to duty from one self-denial to another they rose to a majesty of moral strength impossible to any form of mere self-indulgence it is of souls thus sculptured and chiseled by self-denial and self-discipline that the living temple of the perfect hereafter is to be built the pain of the discipline is short but the glory of the fruition is eternal End of chapter eleven the cathedral